voters see Peter Dutton as more experienced than Anthony Albanese, according to the latest news poll. Let's have a look at this analysis by my colleague, Tom Connell. First of all, let's take a look at experience. This is something that normally would favour an incumbent. This in 2021, for example, this is only a few months before the election. You can see Morrison well ahead of Anthony Albanese, even though Labor was ahead in the polls, because experience is usually who's the better leader. It's usually going to be the person who's Prime Minister who has experience. You can see the big lead for Morrison, but here we've got Dutton ahead of Anthony Albanese. That will be a concern, that you're losing such an incumbent-type vote if you're Anthony Albanese. What about understanding the major issues? Again, this is something you would think you could get some advantage with if you are in the ascendancy. We did see in this measure, again, late 2021, this is December, Anthony Albanese moving ahead of Scott Morrison, but here we see a similar lead for Peter Dutton. So he has the measure on Anthony Albanese in a similar way the Labor leader had it on Scott Morrison. Again, that's a bit of a concern. In some better news for Anthony Albanese, what about the measure of being in touch with voters? This was something the Labor leader had Scott Morrison well ahead of just before the election. He has the same lead right now on Peter Dutton. So in touch with voters, this is a big one for cost of living. Do you understand what voters are going through? That's an important measure to be ahead of. That one, much better news for Anthony Albanese. And the final one I think is always a big one. Who do you trust? When John Howard asked that once upon a time. Well, this was something that we eventually saw Anthony Albanese move just ahead of Scott Morrison of. Again, late 2021. Today, we're seeing a bigger lead for Anthony Albanese in trustworthiness. So what this tells you about this contest overall is we are seeing the Labor leader seed ground on some pretty key questions and experience will be a concern. But Peter Dutton's personal branding, you would say, does still need to improve in the time ahead. He's got time to do that. Oppositions often spend the first half of a term attacking and then trying to burnish their image. So that part's still to go clearly for Peter Dutton. Joining me live now in the studio is political reporter at The Australian, Sarah Ison, and political reporter at The Guardian, Josh Butler. Great to see you both. Nice to have you here in the studio. Sarah, these numbers that Tom went through there in the Oz today, uh, really a tale of two halves for Peter Dutton. He's strong and, and mm. decisive, but not very likeable. Yeah, I think that's something that Peter Dutton has struggled with for a, a while. I think he definitely had Labor being very reactive, even from as far back as, like, sort of December, January last year, like, over the summer, that he started to have them be quite reactive and he was leading the narrative. So I think in terms of experience and some things like that, people can recognise someone who seems to have control and he's not really caught... He hasn't had a, a, a gaffe or a number of kind of slip-ups or anything like that. No. But just broadly, and I think that was something that happened even when he came to be opposition leader, his sort of, like, retail likability has always been a point of, yeah. of contention of people wondering how do you, you know, break through to people when you're seen as, well, not that likeable, I suppose, <laughs> and maybe a bit, you know, extreme. Or when he was in defense, the defence ministry, uh, he said a lot of different things and I think almost as a person he just looks a bit different. So it it is a tough one. I don't know how you just turn that around. People have always just thought those things about done. That's true. It's interesting to see him above Albanese on being more experienced, mm. though. That was... As Tom mentioned, that's, that's, that's unusual. Normally the Prime Minister would be seen more in those terms. Both men have been in this place for, for two decades, respectively. Yeah, it might be that sort of recency bias thing. I think, you know, obviously the Coalition was in government for, you know, a decade before this. Maybe people don't remember that Anthony Albanese was a, you know, senior you know, minister in the, the last government, um, the last Labor government. Um, it, it was interesting, like, you sort of, exactly how you say, you know, tails sort of two halves, like, you can cut up these numbers sort of whichever way you want. I mean, like, on, on the one hand, there's, there's the positive numbers for Dutton. On the other hand, there was, you know, Albanese led on questions of, you know, vision for Australia, cares for people, likeable, um, trustworthy, and then Dutton was higher on, I think, that the, the arrogant yeah. you know, descriptor. Um, when you sort of think about, I guess, what the, the number one issue that both sort of sides agree on at the moment is in Australia, cost of living. And I don't know, like, if, if you were a leader and you're looking at um, what people think about cost of living, I think maybe the ones that are in touch with voters, trustworthy, cares about people, might be ones that more link into that particular issue. Perhaps. Yeah, exactly. So there are enough to keep both smiling over their, mm. their Christmas lunch and, and Sarah... Or equally unhappy or something. Or like maybe sure. equally unhappy, depending on their disposition. But what's your read on where the, the overall polling is at? It seems like there's been a lot of movement up and 
And then down, but then uh, down. we're back to roughly where we were at the election, aren't we? I think that's kind of what one of the main takeaways was after this polling was released, was particularly for a government halfway through a term, you know, about 18 months, and following something like a referendum that wasn't successful and they'd really pinned their hat to, mm. to be at the same point that you were when you won an election, I think is something that, depending on your view, has surprised some. I think the... Labor hasn't taken maybe as much of a hit, particularly post-referendum, as uh, people assumed. There, there has also been those two pauses with the interest rate hikes. Maybe people are, their hostility is a little bit, like, muted right before this polling. But I think it showed a, a resilience when it comes to the government halfway through a term after a few bumps and knocks and facing a pretty challenging second yeah. half of their term when it comes to, as Josh has said, cost of living. Oh, absolutely. And those, those bumps and knocks that Sarah refers to, none bigger than the sequence of interest rate rises. So mm. while the government uh, says it's been banking the upward revisions on revenue and so on, that whoever's in office cops the flack. That's the mm. that's the reality, Josh. Yeah, and I guess, you know, obviously there is this debate about how much of those um, those sort of indicators are, you know, homegrown or, or, you know, global. I mean, obviously the government likes to say that all these factors are, are, are global prices or global issues and the coalition likes to say that a lot of it's homegrown and, you know, some analysts would, would say the same thing. But um, I think, like you say, you know, whichever government's in power at the time is going to cop the flack for this. Um, obviously, the government, I think, is sort of hoping that those... I'm not a you know, economic expert here, but I think um, a, a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe the interest rate hikes are sort of done for the moment. Maybe at some point yeah. next year they start coming down again. Um, so what, what what is your thinking for 2024? What dominates? I think we can't go away from cost of living. Um, I think there are even enough people in the Labor caucus room that are saying the government has to go further on this. I mean, obviously, the government has this sort of list of things when they're asked, you know, what are you going to do about cost of living? They, the answer is, you know, the talking point is sort of now is we've already done this. We've done cheaper mm -hmm. childcare. We've done um, fee-free TAFE. We've done, you know, the cheaper medicines, all these sort of things. Um, I think there will be that pressure on the government to, to, to do more and maybe to come out of the gate strongly uh, at the start of next year with... Um, something in that sort of ballpark. But back to the referendum question, I think, you know, there, there is going to be a lot of um, expectation on the government because they've sort of built it up themselves mm. that they will have to come out with some sort of strong agenda post-referendum on um, dealing with some of those issues that we spoke a lot about through the whole campaign around life expectancy and social outcomes yeah. and health outcomes and all those sort of things. Those, those problems still exist no matter what the result of, obviously, comprehensive loss for the, the voice referendum. But those problems still exist and I think they will be, they'll have to come out and, and have some sort of strong response to that and, early and, next year. And on the on the cost of living front, that, that obviously dominates, as Josh says, mm. and where the rates go. The economy's stupid, as they, as they always say, the, the old American political saying, but that's it to always here, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it will dominate and there will be continued pressure from within and without the party to do more relief and different mm. bits and pieces, but there will still be an expectation, Josh did mention, post-referendum, there is an expectation from the not just Indigenous community but the country of, OK, what are you going to do now? They've got that expectation riding on them. Linda Burney has already said that they're going to have a bit of a plan forward mm. within the first few weeks of next year. So that seems like something they're going to come out of the gate really strongly with. But not only that, there are other cohorts in Australia that are looking at the government quite closely now that the referendum's done, like the religious community. The religious discrimination bill yeah. was something that was huge ahead of the last election. It's something Labor shelved until post-referendum. There's a number of people across Australia that are religious and have different affiliations and are now going, right, you've done the referendum, it is what it is. You've promised us something. You've That's got to deliver. That's a very good point. The, uh, very interesting to see where that goes to. Sarah Ison from The Australian. Josh Butler from The Guardian. Great to see you both. Appreciate it.